taken over Scotland and ruled it. They actually became quite an oppressive ruler of Scotland um, in the midst of this, this political crisis. And a lot of injustice followed suit afterwards. And Wallace and, and many others were fighting for Scottish rule, get the English out, getting rid of all the oppression and the injustice. And one of the greatest lines of the, of the movie, and there are a lot of great lines in the movie, there's a point where, where uh, well, Wallace, he's been, he's been captured by the English and he's arrested and he's being tort literally tortured to death. Literally tortured to death in a very brutal fashion as was characteristic of those days. And, and the whole idea was, you know, all he had to do was, was submit to the king and they would execute him quickly. Otherwise, they would just drag it out, drag it out, drag it out, make it as painful as possible. And in the, in the scene in the movie, he, he, he's just about reached his limit. And the, uh, he, he makes it clear through all his pain that he wants to say something. And the executioner stops and says, thinking he's going to finally acknowledge Edward as king. So he says, stop, you want, the prisoner wants to say something, and you know, he just comes down to him and says, you know, something to speak, and Wallace, barely able to, to take a breath, let alone speak, musters the strength to say his final words. He cries out, freedom! <laughs> to the end. His desire was for freedom from oppression and freedom from injustice. It didn't matter what kind of pain or torture he was subjected to. That was all that mattered. Well, eventually the Scots did throw out the English. I'm not sure which side to cheer for because on one side I'm Scottish and the other side I'm English. <laughs> so I don't know who to cheer for. But they did regain their freedom. Of course, not everything was perfect, not everything worked out ideally. In fact, the whole of human history has been a story of the strong oppressing the weak, hasn't it? From the beginning, we've seen that. Injustice has followed wherever people have gone. The cries of the oppressed, the cries of people seeking freedom have, have rung out loud and strong since very soon after the beginning of the human race. It's just a story of our human history. And it goes on as much today as it did in William Wallace's time, or in biblical times. It's just as much as real today. The Old Testament prophets, they often spoke about injustice, and they spoke on behalf of the people in their desire for freedom, in their desire to escape that oppression and injustice. The prophets also spoke for God when God would condemn it. And he'd look at people who were guilty of that and, and, and he would condemn people for that and call them back to something new, something better. In fact, God promised something new and something better. That the time of injustice and oppression would come to an end. And we read about that when we, when we look at the, the Christmas story, the Advent story, the prophecies that foretold the coming of the Messiah. And, and Isaiah was one who wrote a lot about the coming Messiah. 700 years before Christ came. And he writes these words that, that we, read, we read them last week in, in Isaiah chapter 9. He, he writes this, for, uh, for to us a child is born. We just sang about it. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So much that we could talk about from that verse. Last, last week we talked about the idea that, that Jesus came and he brought a whole new law. That we didn't have to, to live by following rules, that, but, but that God would write his law on our hearts and, and, and that we would 
do by nature, by desire, the things that were right, not doing things because it was written down in the law, but it changes from the inside. Well, it takes it even one step further and talks of, of not just about establishing a new law, but when he talks about the idea of a whole new government and, and, and establishing David's kingdom, that it would be more than just law, but it would be a whole way of ruling over the world. It's Jesus becomes the king. And Jesus comes to set up a whole new kingdom. Now what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? Because when we look at the world, the world hasn't changed a whole lot. We still have the oppression. We still have people rebelling against them. Where is God's rule? Where is Jesus' rule? In fact, even if we, go, if we, if we were to step ahead to, um, to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, and Jesus is before Pilate, and Pilate says to him, So, are, are you a king? Are you really a king? Because that was the charge, remember? Jesus, the king of the Jews. Are you a king? Jesus, if you're a king, where, where, where's your kingdom? If you're a king and this is your kingdom, how come it is that I, Pilate, am able to condemn you to death? Where is your power? It seems that Caesar's power is ruling you. How are you a king? But Jesus said, I am a king. I am a king. But the reality is that Jesus' king, kingdom is not like Caesar's kingdom. It's not like any of the kingdoms of the world. It's not a political thing. You can't, you can't point and find its borders anywhere. You can't say, no, okay, I've stepped across the border, now I'm in you know, someone else's kingdom. Everywhere we go, it's his kingdom. Because his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And it's made mostly manifest in this world in the hearts of people. He rules over my heart. He rules over your heart. And the, the kings of the world, they can rage in vain, the psalmist says. But it makes no difference. God is God. Jesus will rule. He came to establish God's kingdom. He starts in your heart. He starts in my heart. And one day, one day, all those who resist him, all those who rebel against him, the Bible tells us, will be forced to come and bend the knee before him and acknowledge that he is the king. Isn't that quite the thought? We live in a world today where fewer and fewer people believe in God, fewer and fewer people go to church, fewer and fewer people and want to submit their lives to Christ, but the Bible tells us that the day shall come that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That day is coming. But when, G when Isaiah talks about the fact that, that his kingdom will increase, <coughs> that it will increase, it tells us something. It tells us something that we can already see, that we already know, that it's quite evident, that it's not all here yet. It's not all here. People will often say, you know, we, 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 how many times do we have to say what people say about, you know, where is God? If God, if there really is a God, then why this? Why the mess? Why does God allow this? Why does God allow that? Very simple, but simple explanation is God's kingdom is not yet fully established. There are still people who resist. There are still people who don't want to give into God's rule. But the time will come because it is an ever-increasing kingdom. It is an ever-growing kingdom. David wrote in, in, in what we call Psalm 110, he said this, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
The Lord will extend a mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. And he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. The rebels will be put down, in other words. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. And he will drink from a brook along the way. So he will lift his head high. In other words, God is promising that that, that which doesn't seem complete, that which doesn't seem real, will one day be real. That God's kingdom will be fully and firmly established. That we don't have to feel defeated in this world today because we, 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 we seem to be in a minority and there seems to be less and less interest in, you know, that, that, that religion and Christianity and the church are being pushed to the margins and nobody takes us seriously anymore. We don't have to worry about that. Because God's kingdom is ever increasing. And God who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that good to know? Isn't that good to know? That when the day comes that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we don't do it as a defeated rebel. We do it as a willing citizen of his kingdom. And we'll do it with joy. That's good news. That's good news. What's his kingdom like? What's God's kingdom like? Well, it's something that's so much above law. You know, we talked about law, and we're used to law. Governments make laws, right? Sometimes we like their laws, sometimes we don't. But it's something more than law. Isaiah tells us that his, his kingdom will be about justice and will be about righteousness. Now there's, some, there's a difference between law and justice. Isn't there? There's a difference between law and justice. Have you ever seen the, movie, uh, the play or the movie Les Miserables? Anybody seen that? One of my favorites. <laughs> Story of Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean's a young man who was arrested for stealing a loaf of bread. Now we know, the Bible says, do not steal. Just about every society we know has laws against stealing. It's the law. You don't steal. He stole a piece of bread. He was caught. He was arrested. Went to jail. Now in his case, according to the story, he went for an awfully long time. 14 years, 20 years, I forget what it was in the story. For stealing a loaf of bread. But why did he steal a loaf of bread? Because his sister's son was starving. Try to wrap your mind around the, the, the difference between stealing because, hey, I want that, and stealing because if I don't get that, I'm going to starve to death. Is there a difference? I'm not saying that it's ever right to steal. But law says they're the same thing. Justice says there's a big difference, isn't there? Justice says we can't treat them the same, even though in neither case can it be legal. See, one of the great things about justice, if there is really justice in the world, nobody's going to be starving. Nobody is going to be starving at all. Let's look at, for a moment, just remember the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of Jesus' time. They were the most religious people. They had it down pat, right? They, had, they knew what it was to be a Jew. And they weren't Jesus' favorite people. In, in Matthew 23, he says to them, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, 
you know, tithe it. We're supposed to give a tenth of what we have, right? We die. You give a tenth of your spices, of your mint, your dill, of your cumin. And we're going to do that. Expect that next Sunday, right? You've gone into your kitchen cupboards, you're going to take your spice rack, and I want a tenth and all this stuff. That's the way they were. They were that meticulous about the law. It says, but you neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, get this book, without neglecting the former. In other words, he's not saying don't stop obeying the law. Remember, there's got to be a whole lot more to it than just following those little, little, those little trivial little details about it. You know, it's like a little girl's prayer. I've, I've said it so many times here. A little girl who prays, Dear God, make the bad people good and the good people nice. See, good people follow the law. Nice people pursue justice and righteousness. Christians are called to be God's kingdom in the world. It's through us that God makes his kingdom real in the world. And sometimes we have failed miserably, haven't we? Christian history is not one that's just full of highlights and glory shots, a highlight reel, if you like, of wonders of justice and righteousness. Christian leaders have been guilty of every kind of sin, and they have supported at different times every form of injustice the world has known, has ever known. Christians and Christian leaders and churches were, were, were guilty of, of, of supporting and justifying slavery for a long, long time. One well, of the greatest of injustices. But at the same time, Almost every social reform movement the world has ever seen has been spearheaded by Christians. So while on one hand you had Christians who were owning slaves and supporting slavery, on the other hand the abolitionists, led by people like William Wilberforce, who were primarily Christians. Our own Salvation Army, in the midst of the, the, the injustices and the poverty of uh, uh, what William Booth called in darkest England. William Booth came and you know, he, he says to his son Bramwell one day, he says, Bramwell, do you, do you know that there are men sleeping under the bridge at night? And he was appalled by this. And his son Bramwell says, well, yes, I, I, I did know that. And William Booth chastised his son said, Bramwell, do something. Do something. Because it wasn't right that men should be sleeping under the bridge at night because they couldn't afford to live a place to sleep. Fascinating book that William Booth wrote called In Darkest England and the Way Out. Published in 1890. It was, it was his social service scheme. He, was, he wanted to transform the world and he developed an entire plan to transform the world. A social service plan. Now that never quite panned out. But much of what we see in the Salvation Army world today from, from food banks to, to, to hostels to, to you name it flows out of this. Because it was a belief that as Christians we can never be satisfied with a world that's filled with injustice. That's never, that we can never be satisfied with people suffering. And that God has called us to sacrifice ourselves, to sacrifice our own comforts, to sacrifice our own affluence, our own indulgences, our own desires for the, for the welfare of others. That is justice. That is seeking justice and righteousness. That is the kingdom of God. That's what God is aiming for. That's what God expects of us. That's what Jesus came to bring, is a transformed world, and people who work for the transformation of the world. 
If Jesus had never come, the world would have continued on in darkness. And the world may, think, may, may, it may say things like, well, you don't have to be religious to be a good person. But you want to know something? Before the coming of Christ, without God's law, for the most part, we didn't see that. And it was Christ who brought the light into the world to see that it had to be different. And it's become so normal now because of the influence of Christ and his followers the, that the world thinks it's just, well, you don't have to be good. But they never would have thought of it apart from Christ and his presence in the world. Where are we now? Are we people of justice and righteousness? Is God still using us to bring justice and righteousness into his world? It starts, of course, with changing the very heart of people. And only God can do that. Only Christ can do that. <clears throat> because we are so, by nature, trapped in our darkness, trapped in our sin. There is no way that we can ever get ourselves out. But he came to establish a rule in our hearts so that, the, that Satan and the law never rules in our hearts, but that Christ alone rules in our hearts. He sets us free from, from, from the law of sin. He sets us free from guilt and shame. He grants us the forgiveness for all the things that we've ever done. But not only the things that we've ever done, but the things that we will do. Jesus died for sins past, present, and future. Are you going to mess up today? Are you going to mess up tomorrow? I know I will. No matter how hard I try, I'm going to do something wrong. Or I'm going to fail to do something right. Do I need to live worried about that? No. Why? Because Christ has set up his rule in my heart. The work's not complete, but I am set free. And if you have accepted Christ, so are you. So are you. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live worried about the fact that you're going to mess up. Let him lift you up and get you on the road again. Striving always in the power of the Holy Spirit to live according to his kingdom. And by kingdom values. Letting Christ reign in your life. And when he does it with me, and he does it with you, and he does it with you, and you, with that person out there, and that person out there, and we share that with those other people out there, and we bring more and more people together, Christ's kingdom increases and increases and increases, and the world changes. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what God wants? Isn't that what Christmas is all about? You want to keep Christ in Christmas? Yes. It has nothing to do with whether someone at Walmart says to you Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays. <laughs> Remember that. That's irrelevant. It has to do with whether or not Christ rules in your heart. Whether or not you share Christ and His freedom with other people. That keeps Christ in Christmas. Living with justice and righteousness and seeing the growth of His kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you.